morning. I am uh, Father Roger, Chaplain Roger. Happy to be with you today. And just a couple of announcements before we get started. Because we are inside, there is no singing. And therefore, when it comes to hymns, we'll stand for the hymn if you choose to and able to stand, but there'll be no singing. We'll just kind of listen to the beautiful music and we'll sit down. That's why there's no hymnals, no words in the bulletin. All right, and um, uh, Father David uh, left me some good notes, so I think I'll be able to uh, replicate some of what he normally does as far as stage directions or altar directions. All right, so I'm glad to be here, and I guess we'll start with the opening hymn, the processional. Christ is risen. Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the lessons. reading from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our psalm today is Psalm 133. We will read it in unison. You can find that on page 4 of your order of service. Psalm 133. 
Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren leave together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. A reading from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The music to prepare our hearts for the gospel will now begin. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Am I double mic now for this? Are we adjusting that? When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the people, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
a Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in, on the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. And this time, Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these that are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So a few kind of um, announcement kinds of things before we actually get started with the sermon. Um, first of all, I'm grateful to be here. Some of you who were members here or other Episcopal Church may remember that I was employed by you for 14 years to do campus ministry at San Jose State University. And those of you who were part of this congregation in its various incarnations during that 14-year period a very heartily supported campus ministry with your beautiful cell phone cross tower that generated income that you graciously donated for the work of campus ministry. So I thank you very much. I also want you to know that as a supply priest, I have a uh, kind of a basic rule when I go to churches to supply, and I'm sorry to say today that I had to break that rule. Because my rule is that I usually preach as long as it takes me to get to the place I'm going. Now, when I went down to the other side of Salinas, the people really moaned and groaned when I told them that. But today I noticed it only took me less than 15 minutes, and so I'm going to have to add the time it took me to drive here, my bath time, the time it took me to find my shoes, and the time it took me to feed the cat today. So there's no... Eucharist, so we'll have time to I'll have time to talk. <laughs> so I hope you'll find what I have to say um, enlightening and uh, hopefully spiritual and also somewhat entertaining. So first of all, this particular Sunday in the church year has four names to it. You're probably familiar with some of those names. It's called Easter 2, with, you know, two Roman numerals. It's called the second Sunday of Easter. And in clerical circles, it's called Low Sunday. Now, it's called Low Sunday because usually what happens is that after all of Lent in Holy Week, in the Tritium, people are somewhat tired of church, and so they take off a Sunday. And so attendance is low, so that's why they call it Low Sunday. You know, it's also said in clerical circles before the pandemic that if you shot a cannon through the church on Low Sunday, you'd be sure not to hit anybody. So, so it's even more true today. And then the other name that Sunday has today is Doubting Thomas Sunday. Because as we focus on the Gospel reading, we will spend some time digging into some of the background of Thomas. And some of this 
important information I'm going to share to you comes not from Scripture, per se. Some of it does. But a great deal of it has been handed down to us through what could be called legend or hagiography, which means the history of saints. Now, when I was doing campus ministry, and before that, when I was doing ministry with young people, I always kind of liked to talk about Thomas, because I thought Thomas was a really good example for young people, whether they were in middle school, high school, or campus ministry, because Thomas leads a life that is an excellent example to young people who are doubting their faith who are not sure that they want to be a Christian, are not sure that they want to follow Jesus. And so I point to Thomas the Doubter. Now, it is believed that Thomas was a follower or at least a disciple of John the Baptist. So that teaches us that Thomas, from a very early age or time in his life, was searching for God in different kinds of ways. And he found an answer to that in John the Baptist. And then somehow, whether he was present at the baptism of Jesus or not, somehow he became impressed with Jesus. And so he was kind of, yeah, kind of excited about Jesus in his spiritual search. And so one day at the Sea of Galilee, at the little fishing town of Tech, Tachia, he met some of the current disciples of Jesus, and he invited them to his house for a meal. And then while he was at the house, legend tells us that St. Philip nominated him to become a disciple, and Jesus obviously accepted him. You see, Thomas is a seeker. He was always moving forward on his spiritual journey, experimenting, you could say, to find that still small voice that Elijah talks about, of God speaking to him. And because of that, Thomas is the central character in today's gospel. And now, even today, I think Thomas is a great example for adults, too. Because many adults kind of settle into their routines. They think they are secure in their spiritual journeys. And they stop seeking. They stop looking for God. They stop listening for that small, still voice of God. So you see, Thomas is a skeptic. He is pragmatic. He isn't going to believe anything without proof. He will not swallow this bit about Jesus having risen from the grave. He doubts it very sincerely. And in so doing, and so doing to doubt, not only does he doubt that Jesus is risen, he doubts what the experience of the other disciples were, the other men and women who tell him of this story. He doubts them as far as they are, he's concerned their enthusiasm, their excitement, and the stories were proof of absolutely nothing. After all, they were too emotional and too irrational about the whole thing. They couldn't even tell the story of Jesus risen from the dead without breaking into tears of joy. Thomas was different. He is not so emotional. He was realistic. He wasn't going to believe any of these ghost stories. He needed proof, real honest-to-goodness proof, not some psychic phenomena, not some table-raising seance type of thing. He wanted to actually touch Jesus. And he wanted to make sure that the person he was touching was actually Jesus. Jesus with the holes in his hands from the cross nails. Jesus with the wounded side from the soldier's spear. 
he wanted to put his finger into those wounds. Isn't that the way it is with us postmodern folks? We are civilized, thoughtful, smart, reflective, educated, sophisticated people. And we have learned that we have to be doubters in order to survive in this world of spam, of identity theft, of scam, of fraud, etc. And we have all seen enough advertisements, computer-generated graphics and videos, CGI, to know that what you see isn't always real. And probably a few of you have even manipulated some of your own photos using Photoshop or some other app to make yourself look better, to make your picture look more spectacular. Not real, but just spectacular on film or digital. When it comes to religion and faith, it's not much different. All the enthusiasm, all the words, even the experiences of others, when they're told to us, only take us so far. We want proof. Proof that a life in Jesus makes a difference. Hard, cold facts. problem is we want all of this, but we're not willing to experiment even a little bit. We want empirical information, but we aren't willing to enter into a life in Jesus, to enter fully into a life of Jesus, to see if it's all that it's cracked up to be. Now, we can buy different brands of shampoo or gasoline or whatever, TV, computers, and we can try them out. But not many people are willing to really enter into a life in Christ to try it out. And then until you do, you will be like doubting Thomas. Well, how does one enter into a life in Christ to give it a try? You do so by handing over your shortfallings, your sins, to God in Christ. You do so by entering into a life of prayer and a life of service. By being caring, kind, compassionate, non-judgmental, loving people. And to be like Thomas, reaching out and touching the wounds of Christ. To touch the wounds of others is to touch the wounds of Christ. To touch the wounds of being lonely or ill or depressed. To touch the wounds of being unemployed or homeless. To touch the wounds of a hungry stomach. To touch the wounds of those in jail or those disenfranchised to touch the young and the old who are struggling to survive in the world. To reach out and touch, not probe or prod, but to give loving, gentle, kind attention. To care for others, realizing that their wounds are indeed the wounds of Christ. For when we care for their wounds, we tend to the wounds of Christ. So if we want proof of what it means to live a life in Christ, it is there that it will be found. Since the ascension of Christ into heaven, Christ has not been physically present on this planet Earth. And therefore we, and we only, are the healing hands of Christ present to the world today. Now Thomas stands as a reminder to reach out and touch, and by so doing to more fully enter into a life of Christ. Now God, our creator, wants us to enter into this great experiment to live a 
life of Christ. To live a life acknowledging that you dwell in Christ and Christ dwells in you. To live a life recognizing that Christ dwells not only in you, but in everyone you encounter on a daily basis. To live a life recognizing that Christ dwells not only in the people you see and touch, but even in the people that you only experience on the computer, the TV screen, on the phone, on the internet, or read about in the newspaper. People, the almost 8 billion souls who share this planet Earth, with whom you are only partially conscious, Christ dwells in every one of them. All our beloved children of God who calls us to recognize their divinity and to love and to live as loving, caring, kind, non-judgmental, compassionate people. Now, in actuality, there's not much difference between the room in which the disciples encountered Jesus and this room here today. Just as Jesus called Thomas aside and gives him the personal attention he needs to believe, Jesus calls us aside and gives each one of us the personal attention that we crave and need for us to believe and to have the courage to follow in his way. Not only do we receive that personal attention one-on-one -on -one through the sacrament of Holy Communion, but it is a personal attention that is given to our hearts from the heart of Jesus at every moment. It is ours when we take the time to call upon his presence to be with us, when we take the time to listen to that still, small voice. There's another similarity between that room in Emmaus and this congregational hall today. And that is Jesus is telling us not to doubt anymore, but to experience him. For we have been raised with Christ, so therefore seek the things that are above where Christ is, faith, hope, and charity. Now, let's continue the story of doubting Thomas just a little bit further. We see how this doubt is satisfied in the gospel reading today. The experience of putting his hands in the nail wounds of Jesus and in the sword wound of his side, this experience changes Thomas once again on his spiritual journey. This disciple becomes an apostle. And he becomes a very active and effective apostle. The gospel, the good news of Thomas, although it's not in the Bible today, because it wasn't found until 1947, this writing is attributed to Thomas. It may or may not be by the actual person Thomas. It may be like some of the other Gospels are written in the school of Thomas. And actually, from what we know, the Gospel of Thomas actually predates Mark in the other Gospels. And it's very different than the Gospel that we have in the Bible, the canonical Bible. Because when you see the Gospel of Thomas, it is a collection of what we call logion or sayings of Jesus. If you've never read it, find it and read it. This is a very large edition because it has lots of notes with it. But it's a very small, short book with one logion a day. It would be perfect. So you find stuff in here that you don't find in the other Gospels. Let me just read to you one of these logions. If your guides claim that you that the kingdom is in the sky, the birds of the sky will be there before you. 
if they say it is in the sea, the fishes of the sea will be there before you. The kingdom is within you and without you. When you know yourselves, you will be known. Then you shall know that you are the children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, you are in poverty, and you are poverty. So, the story of Thomas even continues on. There is historical evidence that Thomas traveled to India to spread the word of the gospel. And he was successful as an evangelizer in India. And to his witness, there is still a very active Christian community in India that dates back 2,000 years. It's found in the eastern part of India. In fact, I was looking for Easter hymns, and I happened to, on YouTube, and I had a hymn, one of my favorite hymns, and I discovered it was being sung by a church in India. Um, and the choir was all dressed in the saris, etc. So it is still a very active presence in modern-day India. How about you? You obviously have been affected enough by the good news of what Jesus Christ accomplished. You obviously have been affected in your heart by Jesus Christ. You obviously have changed and modeled your life in such a way that you even came to church today on this pandemic low Sunday. So how will Christ continue to change your life? And like Thomas, how will you help change the lives of others for the better? So those are our two reflective questions for the next bit of quiet time. How has your life or how will your life be changed again in your ongoing spiritual journey? And how will you help change the lives of others for the better? So we'll listen to that small, still, quiet voice for a few.
this stand with Christians all over the world today and join with them in saying the Nicene Creed as we express our faith, saying, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. On the third day he arose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Oh, I'm sorry, you got to turn the page. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Prayers of the people today, the second Sunday of Easter, can be found on page 10 of your order of service. On this day, we praise our God for the dying which destroyed our death, and we pray for our world in need of life, saying, Lord, have mercy. The Lord calls us to examine the wounded hands and the feet of the risen one, and to know the depth of his love for us. Let us approach Christ in faith and share the good news with all we meet. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. The apostles received the Holy Spirit and the grace to lighten the burdens of one another's sins. May the church be faithful to this gift. May all the baptized live with abundant compassion for all, especially for those shut out from our society. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ calls us blessed to not having seen, yet believe. May more and more of God's people and all the created order become a sign of the resurrection in the world. And may our faith give courage to the doubting. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We, strengthen, we strengthened by Christ's resurrection to share the power of the Spirit with all the suffering. We pray for all in any need. May the power of the Christ's resurrection give life to all who have little reason to hope. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. May the morning star which never sets, Christ our light, find us burning with, clar with charity until the world is enlightened with love. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Have mercy. Today's intercessions for God's care and healing for those who have been commended to our prayers. From the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Timothy's Mountain View, St. Mark, King City and Santa Clara, St. George Salinas, all who work towards the goal of ensuring environmental stability. We pray for our groups that meet here, AA meetings, Al-Anon meetings, Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Writing Class, Midori Banzai, and Westside Sunnymont Preschool. For people whom we are holding in prayer, for Lynn Park healing from a cat bite, Thanksgivings, thanking God for our many blessings for the ordination anniversary of Julian C. Lentz, for the departed, praying for those whom we love but no longer see, Jenny, Alonzo, Eric, Mike, Walter, Claire, Adeline, Julius, Augie, Donna and Frank Adams, John Felix, 
Jane Arden feel it? Kitty, Beverly, Van, Athelie, Chung, Harry, Craig, and D. Is there anyone else or anything else we should pray for? For all my hospice clients and family. For the victims of the shootings in Florida and Colorado and their families who grieve their loss. Please offer your prayer silently or aloud. Eternal, creative God, give us the faith and courage to recreate the world in your image. We ask this in the name of the risen one, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will. In those good things which we dare not or in our ignorance or blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice.
God again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with us.
thank you. It's very much my honor.